The Biographical Introduction, Part 2, to the Poetical Works of Thomas Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by M.C. Johnny G. The Poetical Works of Thomas Hood, by Thomas Hood. The Biographical Introduction, by William Michael Rossetti, Part 2. We must now glance again at Hood's domestic affairs. His first child had no mundane existence worth calling such, but has nevertheless lived longer than most human beings in the lines which Lamb wrote for the occasion on an infant dying as soon as born. A daughter followed, and in 1830 was born his son, the Tom Hood who became editor of the comic journal Fun, and died in 1874. At the time of his birth, the family was living at Winchmore Hill, thence they were moved about 1832 to the lake house, Wanstead, a highly picturesque dwelling, but scanty in domestic comforts. The first of the comic annual series was brought out at Christmas 1830. In the following couple of years, Hood did some theatrical work, writing the libretto for an English opera which, it is believed, was performed at the Surrey Theatre. Its name is now unknown, but it had a good run in its day. A similar fate has befallen an entertainment which he wrote for Matthews. He also composed a pantomime for the Adelphi, and along with Reynolds, dramatized Gil Blass. This play is understood to have been acted at Drury Lane. The novel of Tilney Hall and the poem of the Epping Hunt were written at Wanstead. Born in comfortable mediocrity and early inured to narrow fortunes, Hood had no doubt entered upon the literary calling without expecting or caring to become rich. Hitherto, however, he seems to have prospered progressively and to have had no reason to regret, even in a wordly sense, his choice of a profession. But towards the end of 1834, a disaster overtook him, and thenceforth to the end of his days. He had nothing but tedious struggling and uphill work. To a man of his buoyant temperament and happy in his home, this might have been of no extreme consequence, if only sound health had blessed him. Unfortunately, the very reverse was the case. Sickly hitherto, he was soon to become miserably and hopelessly diseased. He worked on through everything bravely and uncomplainingly, but no doubt with keen throbs of discomfort and not without detriment at times to the quality of his writings. The disaster averted to was the failure of a firm with which Hood was connected, entailing severe loss upon him. With his accustomed probity, he refused to avail himself of any legal immunities and resolved to meet his engagements in full eventually, but it became requisite that he should withdraw from England." he proposed to settle down in some one of the towns on the rhine and circumstances fixed his choice on koblenz a great storm which overtook him during the passage to rotterdam told damagingly on his already feeble health koblenz which he reached in march eighteen thirty five pleased him at first though it was not long before he found himself a good deal of an englishman and his surroundings vexatiously german after a while he came to consider a german jew and a jew german nearly convertible terms and indulged at times in considerable acrimony of comment such as a reader of cosmopolitan temper is not inclined to approve he had however at least one agreeable acquaintance at koblenz lieutenant philip de frank an officer in the prussian service of partly english parentage the good fellowship which he kept up with this amiable gentleman both in personal intercourse and by letter was as we have seen even boyishly vivacious and exuberant in the first instance hood lived at number three seventy two casterhoff where his family joined him in the spring of eighteen thirty five about a year later they removed to number seven fifty two alton graben spasms in the chest now began to be a trying and alarming symptom of his ill health which towards the end of eighteen thirty six took a turn for the worse he never afterwards rallied very effectually though the fluctuations were numerous in november eighteen thirty eight for instance he fancied that a radical improvement had suddenly taken place and at times the danger was imminent the unfavorable change in question was nearly simultaneous with a visit which he made to berlin accompanying lieutenant de frank and his regiment on their transfer to bromberg the rate of traveling was from fifteen to twenty english miles per diem for three days consecutively and then one day of rest hood liked the simple and extortionate saxon folk whom he encountered on the route 
and contrasted them with the Koblenzers, much to the disadvantage of the latter. By the beginning of December he was back in his Rhineland home, but finally quitted it towards May 1837. Several attacks of blood spitting occurred in the interval. At one time Hood proposed for himself the deadly lively epitaph, Here lies one who spat more blood and made more puns than any other man. About this time he was engaged in riding up the Rhine, performing, as was his wont, the greater part of the work during the night hours. The sojourn at Koblenz was succeeded by a sojourn at Ostend, in which city, besides the sea, which Hood always supremely delighted in, he found at first more comfort in the ordinary mode of living, including the general readiness at speaking or understanding English. Gradually, however, the climate, extremely damp and often cold, proved highly unsuitable to him, and when he quitted Ostend in the spring of 1840, at the close of nearly three years' residence there, it was apparent that his stay had already lasted too long. Within this period, the publication of Hood's own had occurred, and put to a severe trial even his unrivaled fertility in jest. One of his letters speaks of the difficulty of being perfectly original in the jocose vein, more especially with reference to the concurrent demands of Hood's own, and of the comic annual of the year. At the beginning of 1839, he paid a visit of about three weeks to his often regretted England, staying with one of his oldest and most intimate friends, Mr. Dilkey, then editor of the Athenaeum another of his best friends one indeed who continued to the end roost unwearied and affectionate in his professional and other attentions dr elliot now made a medical examination of hood's condition he pronounced the lungs to be organically sound the chief seat of disease being the liver and the heart which was placed lower down than usual at a later stage of the disease enlargement of the heart is mentioned along with hemorrhage from the lungs consequent on that malady and recurring with terrible frequency to these dropsy arising from extreme weakness was eventually superadded indeed the catalogue of the illnesses of the unconquerably hilarious hood and the details of his sufferings are painful to read they have at least the merit of giving a touch of adventitious but intimate pathos even to some of his wildest extravagances of verbal fence and of enhancing our sympathy and admiration for the force and beauty of his personal character which could produce work such as this out of a torture of body and spirit such as that during this visit to london hood scrutinized his publishing and other accounts and found them sufficiently encouraging the first edition of up the rhine consisting of fifteen hundred copies sold off in a fortnight soon however some vexations with publishers ensued hood felt it requisite to take legal proceedings and the action lingered on throughout and beyond the brief remainder of his life thus his prospects were again blighted and his means crippled when most they needed to be unembarrassed the poet was back in england from ostend in april eighteen forty and under medical advice he determined to prolong his visit into a permanent resettlement in his native london here therefore he remained and returned no more to the continent he took a house with his family in camberwell not far from the green removing afterwards to st john's wood and finally to another house in the same district devonshire lodge finchley road he wrote in the new monthly magazine then edited by theodore hook his rhymes for the times the celebrated miss kilman's egg and other compositions first appeared here hook dying in august eighteen forty one hood was invited to succeed him as editor and closed with the offer this gave him an annual salary of three hundred pounds besides the separate payments for any articles that he wrote the song of the shirt which it would be futile to praise or even characterize came out anonymously of course in the christmas number of punch for eighteen forty three it ran like wildfire and rang like a toxin through the land immediately afterwards in january eighteen forty four hood's connection with the new monthly closed and he started a publication of his own hood's magazine which was a considerable success more than half the first number was the actual handiwork of the editor many troubles and cross purposes however beset the new periodical difficulties with which hood was ill-fitted by his now rapidly and fatally worsening health to cope they pestered him when he was most in need of rest and he was in need of rest when most he was wanted to control the enterprise the haunted house and various other excellent poems by hood 
were published in this magazine. His last days and final agonies were a little cheered by the granting of a government pension of 100 pounds, dating from June 1844, which, with kindly but ominous foresight, was conferred upon Mrs. Hood as likely to prove the survivor. This was during the ministry of Sir Robert Peel, whose courteous communications to the poet and expressions of direct personal interest in his writings made the boon all the more acceptable. Hood, indeed, had not been directly concerned in soliciting it. At a somewhat earlier date, January 1841, the Literary Society had, similarly unasked, voted him a sum of fifty pounds, but this he returned although his circumstances were such as might have made it by no means unwelcome. From Christmas 1844, he was compelled to take to his bed and was fated never to leave his room again. The ensuing spring, throughout which the poet lay seemingly almost at the last gasp day by day, was a lovely one. At times he was delirious, but mostly quite clear in mind, and full of gentleness and resignation. Dying, dying were his last words, and shortly before, Lord, say, Arise, take up thy cross, and follow me. On the 3rd of May, 1845, he lay dead. Hood's funeral took place in Kensal Green Cemetery. It was a quiet one, but many friends attended. His faithful and loving wife would not be long divided from him. Eighteen months later, she was laid beside him dying of an illness first contracted from her constant tendance on his sickbed. In the closing period of his life, Hood could hardly bear her being out of his sight, or even right when she was away. Some years afterwards, a public subscription was got up, and a monument erected to mark the grave of the good man and true poet who sang the song of the shirt. The face of Hood is best known by two busts and an oil portrait, which have both been engraved from. It is a sort of face to which apparently a bust does more than justice, yet less than right. The features, being mostly by no means bad ones, look better when thus reduced to the mere simple and abstract contour than they probably showed in reality, for no one supposed Hood to be a fine-looking man. On the other hand, the value of the face must have been in its shifting expression, keen, playful, or subtle, and this can be but barely suggested by the sculptor. The poet's visage was pallid, his figure slight, his voice feeble. He always dressed in black, and is spoken of as presenting a generally clerical aspect. He was remarkably deficient in ear for music, not certainly for the true chime and varied resources of verse. His aptitude for the art of design was probably greater than might be inferred from the many comic woodcut drawings which he has left. These are irresistibly ludicrous. Who would not laugh over the spoiled child? What next? As the frog said when his tail fell off, and a host of others. And all the more ludicrous and effective for being drawn more childishly and less artistically than was within Hood's compass. One may occasionally see some watercolor landscape bit or the like from his hands pleasantly done, and during his final residence in England, he acted upon an idea he had long entertained, and produced some little in the way of oil painting. He was also a genius in any sort of light fancy work, such, for instance, as carving the scenery for a child's theater, which formed the delight of his little son and daughter. His religious faith was, according to the writers of the memorials, deep and sincere, though his opposition to sectarian narrowness and spite of all sorts was vigorous, and caused him sometimes to be regarded as anti-religious. A letter of his to a tract-giving and piously censorous lady who had troubled him, published in the same book, is absolutely fierce, and indeed hardly to be reconciled with the courtesy to a woman as a mere question of sex. It would be convenient, I may observe, to know more plainly what the biographers mean by such expressions as religious faith, Christian gentlemen, and the like. They are not explained, for instance, by adding that Hood honored the Bible too much to make it a task book for his children. Religious faith covers many various serious differences of sentiment and conviction. 
between natural theology and historical Christianity. And on hearing that a man possessed religious faith, one would like to learn which of the two extremes this faith was more nearly conversant with. In respect of political or social opinion, Hood appears to have been rather humane and philanthropic than democratic or liberal in the distinct technical sense. His favorite theory of government, as he said in a letter to Peel, was an angel from heaven and a despotism. He loved neither Whigs nor Tories, but was on the side of a national policy. War was his abhorrence, and so were the wicked corn laws, an oligarchical device which survived him, but not for long. His private generosity, not the less true or hardy for the limits which a precarious and very moderate income necessarily imposed on it, was in accordance with the general sentiments of kindness which he was wont to express both in public and private. If he preached, he did not forget to practice. It has been well said that the predominant characteristics of his genius are humorous fancies grafted upon melancholy impressions. Yet the term grafted seems hardly strong enough. Hood appears by natural bent and permanent habit of mind to have seen and sought for ludicrousness under all conditions. It was the first thing that struck him as a matter of intellectual perception or choice. On the other hand, his nature being poetic, his sympathies acute, and the condition of his life morbid, he very frequently wrote in a tone of deep and indeed melancholy feeling, and was a master both of his own art and of the reader's emotion. But, even in work of this sort, the intellectual execration, when it takes precedence of the general feeling, is continually fantastic, grotesque, or positively mirthful. And so again with those of his works, including rude designs along with finished or offhand writing, which are professedly comical, the funny twist of thought is the essential thing, and the most gloomy or horrible subject matter is often selected as the occasion for the hoarse laugh. In some of his works, indeed, we might cite the poems named The Dead Robbery, The Forge, and The Supper Superstition. The hoarse laugh almost passes into a nightmare laugh. A ghoul might seem to have set it going, and laughing hyenas to be chorusing it. A man of such a faculty and such a habit of work could scarcely in all instances keep himself within the bounds of good taste, a term which people are far too ready to introduce into serious discussions for the purpose of casting disparagement upon some work which transcends the ordinary standards of appreciation, but a term nevertheless which has its important meaning in its true place. Hood is too often like a man grinning awry or interlarding serious and beautiful discourse with a nod, a wink, or a leer, neither requisite nor convenient as auxiliaries to his speech and to do either of these things is to fail in perfect taste sometimes not very often we are allowed to reach the close of a poem of his without having our attention jogged and called off by a single interpolation of this kind and then we feel unalloyed when we constantly feel also even under the contrary conditions how exquisite a poetic sense and how choice a cunning of hand were his on the whole we can pronounce hood the finest english poet between the generation of shelley and the generation of tennyson end of the biographical introduction part two this recording is in the public domain